I stand before you today as a candidate for the Democratic nomination for the presidency of the United States of America. I am not the candidate of black America, although I am black and proud. I am not the candidate of the women's movement of this country, although I am a woman and I'm equally proud of that. I am the candidate of the people of America. In 1972, Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm announced her run for President of the United States, the first ever such bid by a black woman for a major party. It was just four years after she became the first black woman elected to the House. And in the 49 years since Chisholm's historic announcement, black women have made big strides when it comes to elected office. But this week offered a reminder of how much remains undone, especially when it comes to electing a black woman as governor, something no state in this country has ever done. On Tuesday, Virginia Democrats cast their final gubernatorial primary ballots. They had the chance to position one of two different black women candidates to break that particular glass ceiling. Instead, they gave Terry McAuliffe the opportunity to vie for another shot at becoming the state's governor. And it is not just governorships. Only eight black women are currently serving as mayors of the country's 100 biggest cities. And there are currently no black women in the U.S. Senate. Congressman Val Demings is hoping to change that, announcing her challenge to Florida GOP Senator Marco Rubio. And North Carolina, Sherry Beasley and Erica Smith are both vying for Senator Richard Burr's seat as he prepares to retire. The 2020 election actually saw a record number of black women run for Congress. But it's not about the running. It's about the institutional support necessary to win. Here with me now, Glenda Carr, president, CEO, and co-founder of Higher Heights for America, a PAC dedicated to electing progressive black women to office. This is what you think about every day, right, Glenda? This is the work that you do, which is for a long time, it was about convincing women to run. And I think part of what you have recognized is that that's just a piece of the puzzle. When we're talking about black women running for office, what we're really talking about is the institutional gap in support. Absolutely. I mean, we've proven that black women are the architects to our democracy. We've been engaged in being organizers and thought leaders since the 19th Amendment. You had black suffragists who sat at that table knowing that their work would not reap the benefit of them being able to vote. Uh, and that's what you've seen. Shirley Chisholm boldly stepped off the sidelines in 1968 and then in 1972 uh, to make a point about black women's leadership. Um, I love the fact that she played um, um, Barbara Jordan and a quote that she had was, what the people want is simple. They want an America as good as its promise. Um, and so black women leaders um, are bold leaders, um, but there are still institutional obstacles and man-made barriers put into their place when they're thinking about running for office and particularly running for mayors of top 100 cities, um, U.S. Senate and statewide executive offices. So let's talk about why those three are unique, because I think sometimes people point to legislative bodies and they say, see, legislative bodies are diversifying. Isn't that proof of progress? And it is. But there seems to be a particular challenge when you're talking about women in general and black women specifically ascending to executive leadership positions. What do you see as the difference there? Yeah. I mean, we've seen incremental gains. Um, you showed that there are eight black women serving as mayors of top 100 cities right now. That is up from just two in 2014. Um, and so you've seen incremental gains. But it is about that early support. Um, we've seen that in 2020, that there is a, uh, from polling and research that we've done with Brilliant Corners research, that there is an appetite among women voters, both white women, women of color, and black women, that they're looking to elect the next generation of leader. And they believe that that is someone that can unify their city, state, and nation. Um, and they're excited about making history. Uh, and black women are at the top of their list as someone that we ought to be supporting. And so a announcement of a Val Demings this week um, and seeing a group of major influencers and organization endorsing her on day one, you know, Higher Heights for America PAC was excited to endorse her day one. That is early support. She has a longer runway to raise money build a campaign team and build a coalition of not only diverse voters, but diverse um, supporters across the country and in Florida. I want to 
underscore why we're talking about this right now, which is this week there was a race in Virginia that had a lot of attention, both because of the candidates that were a part of that race and because I think we are all looking for indications of what our politics, our national politics are going to look like in the coming years. People felt like this race was an early indicator. Your organization, of course, uh, endorsed Jennifer Carroll Foy in that race. I mean, when you watch that race, what are the lessons that you can glean from what happened in Virginia? There are a couple of lessons from Virginia. Virginia has elected um, African American lieutenant governor and a, and, a, and, and a governor. There were black men in um, in the past. They are continue to see more black women running for a statewide office. And this election showed the you know the tale of the two Jennifers, two black women who were state legislators, come from slightly different um, backgrounds and lived experiences, but both qualified and were able to raise multi you know multiple multi-million dollar campaigns, build a diverse coalition of voters and um, supporters. What is unique about Virginia was they were running against, as I call, a uh, an, an incumbent um, an incumbent governor adjacent, right? Uh, Terry McAuliffe was a well-liked and well-known um, governor. What this race showed is that you two black women, they came in second and third, um, 20%. Jennifer Carroll Foy raised five million dollars if you go back to the the last election cycle um when um, governor northam um ran that campaign he ran and um, raised seven million dollars so if you talk about a race that was truly an open race with not a former governor that would have been a competitive race but the lessons learned is that black women we're normalizing black women's leadership that black women are ready and have been um, able to run, raise money and build a coalition. And so it is about taking the lessons learned from 2018, Stacey Abrams gubernatorial run in Georgia, 2021 Virginia's governor's race, and that will build for 2022 and beyond. And what you will see is that the map for black men running for governor, there it's in the deep South. Um, South Carolina, black woman has just announced, um, Senator Mia McLeod, uh, there's a black woman who is um, exploring a run in Massachusetts, the Northeast, Danielle Allen, and there are black women consider running for governor across this country in the Midwest. Um, and um, you will see in the next 10 years, which is the work of Higher Heights, is that we're building what is an opportunity map for black women's political leadership at the highest levels. And you will see that is about that pipeline work, building on the legacy of Barbara Jordan, um, Shirley Chisholm, Kamala Harris, and Stacey Abrams. And in the next 10 years, you will see not one black woman governor, but we will see black women governors and black women U.S. senators across this country. Because I have about 30 seconds, and I'm going to ask you a question that is too complicated to answer in 30 seconds, so you'll forgive me, which is it's also been posited to me that one of the things the Democratic Party needs to get comfortable doing is clearing primary fields for some of these candidates if they really want to see them succeed. Is that something you think they need to do? Yeah, I mean, we always encourage that we want people to run, but being able, if we have historically cleared the field for white candidates, um, we have proven that black women have built winning campaigns with less money, with no party support, no institutional support. Imagine accelerating the work when black women have the power and the power and the influence of party leadership, of institutional leadership, thought leaders and donors early. They will then be able to focus on these competitive races that are that are general election um, races like a Florida election. Glenda Carr, you managed to answer a seemingly unanswerable question in a very short amount of time. For that, I thank you. Thanks so much for being with us. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.